Good morning and welcome to the PSA 2021 virtual annual meeting. I hope, I hope with our technical difficulties that you may have already had a chance to explore the conference venue and like what you see. We have an exciting four days of wonderful symposium presentations as well as over 450 oral and poster presentations available for viewing at your convenience. In addition, we have several fun events for you to enjoy including a truly entertaining virtual magician, PSA's first student family feud competition match, and the 100th anniversary celebration of our flagship journal, Poultry Science, which debuted in October 20, 1921. We will also be holding our awards ceremony on Thursday, where we will honor our 2021 award winners, highlight our new PSA fellows, and announce the winners of the student competition certificates of excellence. With that, I thank you for being part of this year's meeting and for your support of PSA. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Bruce Rathgaber, Dalhousie University, and President of the Canada Branch of the World's Poultry Science Association. Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So it's my privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for the conference, and we've been doing this as uh, WSA, D, uh, WPSA partners for a number of years now. Uh, normally we'd be up on stage, the American president and, and myself as Canadian president to introduce the speaker, but today it's just myself. Uh, the Canadian branch has chosen this year's speaker and this is uh, Rosita Dara. She is the principal investigator of data management and privacy governance. Um, at uh, University of Guelph. Her research interests include data analytics, data governance, privacy enhancing technologies, and she has uh, um, gracefully agreed to speak with us today. She has uh, an interesting background that includes working for BlackBerry in, uh, in Ontario as um, a inf information and technology officer. And so without wasting too much additional time, I'd like to introduce Rosita here this morning. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to, pro uh, to present in this forum. I want to uh, thank uh, the organizing committee, especially Bruce, for inviting me uh, to present. Um, I have to start sharing my slides. I guess I'm sharing my slides, so I'll <laughs> put it on presentation mode. Um, so as uh, Bruce kindly uh, introduced me, my name is Rosita Dara. I'm a faculty at the School of Computer Science, University of Guelph. I have both industry and government work experience before jo joining the university. Um, I have also uh, another responsibility at the university. I'm data strategy director working with Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance, which is a department or, or small organization be, you know, between University of Guelph and the MAFRA. I basically work, uh, help them and work with them on managing our uh, research, agricultural research data, in particular our smart farms, livestock, and uh, plant as well. Um, the, the topic of my talk today is utilizing big data in smart poultry farming opportunities and challenges. In, in particular, I want to look at the holistic view uh, on the opportunities and challenges and um, combine uh, technology, process, and people. That's, that's the direction that the technology is going. It's no longer, technology is no longer isolated. It's, it's uh, an integrated part of our life. So I want to put emphasis on the importance of this integration. Uh, when I came to New York 12, I started a very applied research in the area of data management and privacy governance. Uh, being at the University of Guelph, I started using, uh, applying my expertise to digital agriculture. Uh, I have several projects that I, I cannot present here. I briefly touch on those, but if there's any questions, I have uh, more practical knowledge of some, some of these topics. For example, me and my colleagues at Ontario Veterinary College um, uh, you, uh, build a decision support system for avian influenza. We collect data from several different sources, kind of have one health approach to uh, predicting, monitoring, and uh, assessing risk in certain reg regions for avian influenza. Um, I also have a project um, 
that my students reach out to farmers, uh, interview them about their concerns or expectations for privacy, trust, and you know, uh, the, and also expectation of technology. Uh, I also have, as I told you, I also work with the university to manage um, our data, but uh, our research data, but now it's turning to a research, which I will touch on it uh, throughout my presentation. But probably you have been, um, so uh, one, one thing that I want to point out, I'll, I'll, I'll do it a little bit later. Uh, so uh, probably you have heard about the need of in, uh, increasing need to generate more food with the population growing, limited resources, and all almost developing countries all over the world, uh, the demand for food, high quality food is increasing. Uh, so I want to, today I want to approach, and the need for technology because of th that need for optimization obviously has gained a lot of attention in agriculture. But I want to take a different, slightly different view, although they are very much interlinked and related. Uh, UN in 2015, they, uh, they come up with sustainable uh, development goals for 2030, uh, some objectives to, to, to get there. There are 17 goals, some of them are very, uh, I mean, some of them are agriculture related. Um, also just recently, um, European Commission, they have come up with another view of their uh, sustainability, in particular for agriculture, but very pragmatic and ambitious goal around uh, that uh, that needs to be met by European Union by 2050 it has four pillars and I want to analyze uh, a bit what we have the landscape of data technology from that perspective uh, international po poultry council in 2020 they uh, they had a few meetings and they come up with uh, priorities and objectives to meet UN sustainable goals and I took the liberty to look at their report and kind of link what they have come uh, put as objectives and how they have prioritized goals for the poultry community. And uh, obviously it's not limited. I didn't have enough space to put everything. In terms of food loss and uh, waste prevention, you know, improving infrastructure to, minim um, to minimize food waste, improve genetics, um, reduce risk of disease, you know, you know in a way to protect uh, waste, I mean, prevent waste and food loss. Uh, from sustainable food consumption, uh, reduce food waste, obviously, and avoid uh, health issues, uh, improve shelf life of store and storage ability, provide consumers with choice of, uh, for, of products and uh, ensure food integrity. Um, for uh, sustainable food uh, and uh, sustainable food and processing distribution, Basically, promoting low emission technology and, pra uh, and practices, increasing efficiencies and optimizing logistics and engaging with supply chain. So it's improving the supply chain logistic, improve life uh, shelf life of uh, products, improving ingredients, and uh, finally sustainable food production, which is one of the major topics. Improving poultry production, biosecurity, and health issues. Um, you know, uh, improve feed and raw materials. I, I can go on and on, uh, raise poultry efficiency to enhance production and reduce environmental impact and many, many other priorities uh, IPC had, um, had identified. But I also, there was a lot of buzz um, after European Union com came up with this, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, sustainability goals and I have to say there they look at it very pragmatically because there are obligations to use new research and innovation and also share data share experience and uh, because it is a regulation you uh, many I mean European uh, countries they have to uh, kind of uh, comply with it so it's a very pragmatic approach but there has also been a lot of discussion about negative aspect of technology of course uh, any technology has a good side and a bad side, but also positive and how it can enhance, uh, enable uh, countries and organizations and farmers, uh, just name it, any agriculture sector to improve environmental sustainability and, and meet the sustainability goals. So, uh, so the use of technology, whether it's to feed more people or uh, for climate change, uh, purposes or to, for, to, to meet sustainability goals have been highlighted in uh, 
by many, many political uh, officials or researchers, just name it. Uh, so I just want to look at uh, smart farming, kind of a digital technology landscape, and just look at what exists. Obviously, for smart farming, and I'm, my focus is not only poultry, <laughs> we have all sorts of technologies, and some of them may not be included here. From social media, access to open data, software, various sensors that are being built every day, new ones, virtual reality, augmented reality, blockchain, artificial intel intelligence, cloud computing, Internet of Things, which are, you know, with sensor, it's just, it's just constantly gr growing and robotic. So we have lots of uh, technologies uh, that are being, uh, you know, they are constantly being improved in terms of processing, at least, uh, capability, storage, and all sorts of things. But all these technologies generate their own data, so that can be used to secure platforms, you know, in, improve uh, their performance, also, data is being fed to many of these technologies. So um, they both contribute to generation, to generating new data uh, and also processing data. In terms of information landscape, again, I haven't put everything, but more specifically for poultry and also I think for all livestock and uh, uh, the you know, uh, plant and uh, just name it. So it's not limited to those, but we have all sorts of data that are being collected in a kind of fragmented way uh, from climate, again, social media, uh, you know, uh, disease outbreak data, farm management data that is being supply chain data, consumer packaging, transport. Uh, so I just kind of lump all the data in, at the farm uh, for farm management. So all devices are collecting data from uh, about climate, you know, and uh, Live uh, animals, animal health activity, feeding, and and uh, just name it. So we are generating a lot of data, but data is fragmented, and each of these devices, uh, they're generating their own data. So uh, the good news is uh, we we will continue uh, collecting more data, and uh, as you can see here, by 2050, 4.1 million data points will be collected in each farm, on average. Right now, um, uh, I think 2020, almost, it was supposed to be, uh, I think I just had a quick look, it was 750,000 on average each farm. And also, uh, you know, the number of sensors that are being used uh, or data collection mechanism tools, automated data collection tools is increasing at farms as well. So we are generating a lot of data. And what I've learned in my, uh, in my role as we are collecting data from our smart farms, many of the data that um, basically farm managers see, uh, that's not the only data that gets collected. In the back end, as we were able to get access to it, there are many, many tables that at least to the farm managers and even to the researchers, they don't know what they are. And I'm pretty sure many of these technology providers are not even sharing all that data. So the data we see and that is being used at the farm is maybe a 10% or 20% portion of what exactly is being generated. And some of them could be device data. It doesn't have to be agriculture data because they have to collect data to measure productivity and uh, you know, ensure security and those sorts of things for the devices. Um, so in terms of, okay, so we are collecting all this data. What can we do? We can do all sorts of things. I mean, sustainability goals that I just mentioned, uh, you know, just uh, poultry product waste, maybe uh, we can manage that quality and security. We can increase productivity and profitability. Uh, we can, uh, I mean, farmers can enhance uh, marketing strategies or processors. Uh, you know, we can address regu regulatory requirements and, um, you know, uh, improve management of risk, disease outbreak. And uh, sorry, it's, I, was supposed, I was supposed to go up. On the farm level, there are lots of things that can be done with the data that is being generated on the industry level as well. Uh, again, uh, that efficiency of farm will be replicated, will be repl kind of um, impacted industry practices as well. So better the decision, uh, business decision, uh, you know, optimization throughout the supply chain, whether through traceability or other methods. Um, industry practices can be improved, uh, quality control, quality of food. I don't know why this is doing this. Okay, sorry. And the policy, uh, the data we collect, obviously it has to inform policy. That's one of the objectives of um, 
the farm to fork strategy in Europe. They want to make informed policy based on data. You know, uh, on impact on rural community could be positive. Uh, international co collaboration could be enabled. And consumer level, it can bring transparency. It can enhance food co quality, consumer satisfaction, potentially give consumer more options in terms of, you know, making decisions. So there are lots of benefits that are not even included in, on this list. So uh, that's great. Uh, this is another uh, view of... Uh, uh, how much data we will have. I think it's uh, it's a kind of a modest uh, estimation, but in 2025, which is four years from now, uh, we will need one trillion, for example, laptop, terabyte laptop to, um, uh, you know, store uh, farm data, which I think is a, a kind of conservative uh, uh, estimation of uh, how much data is being now generated. But there is a problem. IBM, IDC, all of these, they have reported that in 2014, only 1% of generated data is being used. And this is not for agriculture. This was in general. And by 2020, only 13%. And IBM also reported in 2014 that the uh, farms uh, are, or uh, farm as an industry, it's one of the sectors that they are not using technology, uh, you know, uh, so they are not taking advantage of technology. They are kind of on the lowest uh, side in terms of how uh, their system or practices use the technology. And uh, so why, if we have a kind of uh, increasing need for data and we also have lots of data, why aren't we using in a way that is beneficial and can uh, satisfy and I can enable us to meet the goal for more food and sustainable practices. So and now I want to talk about, so the, I kind of cover some opportunities, but now I want to talk about challenges. Uh, so I have hands-on experience and my also my team, both at BlackBerry and uh, you know uh, on kind of data, data traceability, data quality. So I want to touch on the same challenges exist for smart farming. Um, and even more because it's just multiple stakeholders, they have to work together. So it brings human aspect and policy aspect and uh, to this whole complex paradigm as well. But uh, I want to say one of the major challenges right now is data management. And I have separated interoperability, I'll touch on that, is that we are collecting all this data. Data is not of high, first of all, security and privacy is an issue. You know, the farmers have concerns about sharing data. They are concerned about ownership of their data, you know, and those challenges and, and governance. Basically, in general, governance challenges are major and we haven't addressed those yet. The other major issue, in my opinion, is interoperability, enabling technologies, processes, and uh, people to work all of them together. Again, it's fragmented. People don't know how to, farmers or farm managers, they don't know how to use technologies. Uh, there is, uh, data is of low quality. Data sharing is an issue. Even if somebody wants to share, the platform is in there, the technology is in there. Uh, and then even if you have lots of data, how are you going to use it? Who's going to make the decision how data should be used to inform decision? You know, so, so it's very tough to put all these different pieces together of data and technology together to make sense of it. You know, it's, it's something gradually we are working on, but what's the long way to go? As I said, uh, agriculture, because there are many different organizations and, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> people involved, then human aspect is very important. We can refer to privacy, we can refer to trust, accountability, who gets access to data, who makes the decision based on the data they're collecting. So that's an issue. There are some policies uh, that are not helping with the technology adoption. Awareness about technology, for example, one of the misperceptions uh, that probably many people have is around data ownership. Nobody owns the data these days because, you know, <laughs> the Usually, the sensor is provided by the technology provider, by by the you know by a company, and the company owns that uh, that that piece of technology, and they collect data. So the issue of one person, one group owning it, doesn't make sense. But there are other ways that, for example, how much control, whether somebody wants to delete their data from platform, would that be doable? How it's being used? Those are the type of questions should be asked. 
but there is a lot of still focus on ownership. So this our awareness should be given about how technology works. And the truth is AI works better with more data. So, so those type of training and awareness is now missing and the right skills and knowledge is now um, not available to the point to enhance adoption and usage of uh, these technologies and also making those technologies because there's a gap between two side tech, um, technocrats and um, I, I, actually agriculture experts. And some other challenges, obviously costs and other things, um, which some companies such as Microsoft has focused on, for example, costs and those sorts of things. And access to big data infrastructure, so uh, I want to quickly go over these challenges. Um, as I mentioned, data management, in my opinion, is the major challenge. I always say technology is not the problem or, or the hur hurdle, it's the governance and management. So the issue around data ownership, stewardship, who, who's protecting my data, how they're using it, uh, you know, uh, the policy and regulations and legislation that limits the use of technology or adoption of technologies, the trust awareness piece, uh, you know, uh, so I separate privacy and confidentiality because privacy is protecting individuals and personal data. Confidentiality is based on, uh, you know, agreements uh, that are between an organization and people. Uh, data security is always a challenge, but to me, that's the easiest part. Uh, at the farm level, uh, security hygiene are very important because farmers, they don't protect network is the role of the organization, um, the technology provider. They don't protect sensors. Again, it's their role. But there are things that they need to do in terms of selecting password, not sharing password, closing, um, you know, the area that has a sensor, you know, so th there are some security hygiene that they need to follow and uh, practice. Other than that, it's, I think, data security, if somebody is willing to spend the money or if the organization, this uh, technology provider has the resources, that's that's an, something easy to address. Data governance, as I said, lots of um, uh, challenges there. Data sharing, uh, both procedural and technology-wise, database management, operationalizing privacy uh, policies and procedure processes. Uh, another major challenge, which is that throughout the supply chain is around interoperability. So interoperability is the ability of people and processes to work and technologies to work together. And uh, with fragmented ecosystem of uh, food supply chain, it makes it extremely challenging because all stakeholders have their own needs. They have their own requirements. And it's it makes it extremely hard to uh, address interoperability. I worked on mobile health technologies uh, before, uh, I would say uh, agriculture is more challenging just because the stakeholders are way more diverse. Uh, so now we have lots of technologies, absolutely fragmented. How can we put this together? Uh, I mean, what are the set of technologies that we need to put together to address technology, data integration, data sharing, uh, data privacy, and those sorts of things? and also enhance the use of data that is being generated and, and, and uh, expedite the use of data that is being generated. Um, so interoperability challenges, can, we can put them in four categories, legal, operational, semantic, and technical. So the legal is uh, being able to work together based on legal and regulations. Uh, we have an understanding, common understanding, and we can work together, whether it's a technology process or people. Operationalizing is all about policy protocols and processes, again, alignment around those, whether it's, again, through technology or just procedures, trust, accountability, and those sorts of things. Some of them are legal, some of them are operational. Semantic is all about data, data quality, data definition that is aligned, because when we want to integrate system, for example, in blockchain that is fully integrated, <clears throat> semantic interoperability is an absolutely a challenge. It's a major challenge that needs to be addressed for technologies such as blockchain or others. <clears throat> Basically integrated platform. And technical interoperability is something, again, I think if we focus on, it would be the easiest to address. We want to integrate systems. How can we integrate it? What a APIs should be generated and how it can be done? Um, very quickly, uh, the ones that I want to focus more uh, <clears throat> so uh, there are some challenges about legal interoperability, kind of vague data li licenses, uh, license models, 
Uh, we, do, we don't have the, the full understanding of the legal landscape around digital agriculture. Semantic interoperability is something that I focus on, which is around data quality. This is something we are doing for our smart farms. The quality of data should be farmed. First of all, do we have definition? Lots of data we collect, nobody has any idea what those are. Do they have the right definition, format, at, uh, and does it represent the problem that we can use it for that specific purpose? Um, so data com compatibility, the meaning. So let's say if I want to share our research data, uh, research station data with another organization, if they have been collecting data in a different way, if they have different definition for the data, is the, then we cannot integrate. Is vocabulary the same? Is the, is the format the same? Uh, is it accessible? Can we reuse the data? You know, so lots of those sorts of things. Uh, the use of taxonomies and, and ontology to make that common definition uh, so that data flow can be enabled, data integration can be enabled. Uh, kind of uh, uh, contextual analysis and querying can be enabled. So we need some standards or at least harmonization. And by standards, I don't mean all standards have to be the same. It could be different standards, but you build API or kind of uh, some sort of software or tools to be a to enable that integration with minimal effort. Right now, it's huge. We, we can work months and months on the data that is being collected at research station, and we still have a lot more, lot more work to do. So operational, uh, it's just lots, you know, usability, trust, again, data sharing. Now, okay, data is shareable because it is uh, semantic interoperability has been addressed and legal aspect has been addressed. Do we agree on it? So now let's sit down and talk about it. Uh, so those are those are com those conversations are not taking place. APIs, um, you know, so having understanding of responsibilities and those sort of things. Um, the technical interoperability is all about technology, security, uh, you know, um, people requirement, organization requirement, security standards, and those sort of those stuff. So this is also <laughs> aside from those. These are some other limitations that I. Um, that were on my list, but I don't want to go more in depth. For example, we are looking at uh, lack of trust, ethical and responsible development. These are the things that in agriculture, especially at farming, which is very critical, hasn't been, not that much attention has been paid to these uh, particular challenges or needs. Um, you know, people awareness and training and those sort of are requirements and also the need for changing policies. Uh, for example, GDPR is a is a uh, is a legislation that protects personal data. This doesn't apply to uh, farm data in Canada, and I don't believe it, it applies in US either. But that's a way of protecting very sensitive information and having a kind of a broader uh, policy on the side to also enhance utilization of um, farm data. We don't we don't have that in. We are not protecting farm data or very sensitive personal data. At the same time, we are not opening the use of um, uh, you know, farm data either. So we have to revisit our policies. And these are just some that I can think of and comment on. So now, um, how can we democratize technology and uh, data for smart farming? Uh, so uh, I want to go over some technologies, but uh, I need to. Um, so anyway, uh, if I'm if I'm go over time, somebody will can interrupt me. Uh, so what do we want to do here? We want to increase access to integrated and robust and advanced data processing infrastructure that in, that enables integration and analysis of large, high quality data, while retaining trust, ensuring data confidentiality and integrity, and enhancing usability and utility. As you can see in throughout my presentation, I. Uh, I mean, I didn't use the word big data that much because, you know, at the time of big data is over, we are generating um, lots of lots of data uh, online, us as, you know, people. And uh, the use of AI machine learning, everybody knows that these technologies have to be integrated, that data needs to be used. So um, all the data that we are creating, big or small, I mean, they are large. We don't make decision based on big data. We make decision based on small data. But it's big data that gets analyzed, gets uh, trans uh, translated to smaller data, so that we can make decision. 
So the back end of everything that I'm speaking right now is big data. And all the challenges that I mentioned was also related to big data because volume, velocity, all, all those 5 V uh, requirements and uh, I mean, characteristic of big data creates, imposes these challenges to the system. Um, we need to work on data flow. And this is data collection, automated digitization of data collection because that brings accuracy and kind of consistency and standardization to data. And also we need to enhance through harmonization, the use of ontologies, taxonomies, any method that we can to bring some sort of harmonization to definition and data that is being collected at the farm so that we can build this pipeline of data uh, transfer, sharing, integration. Again, that doesn't mean if we do this, it has to be integrated. We can give more control to the farmers or producers or whoever has control over the data, but if we need to enable that type of uh, characteristics, whether it's to making it smart data or whatever we can, we have to embed those characteristics into our system and our data. Uh, so there are some standards exist, so we don't need to start from scratch. Many um, ontologies exist. People have spent time to create those ontologies, which is we are using for our research but it could be used in real uh, kind of real world application. Legal processes, we have to have a common understanding uh, of the governance requirements. We have to connect, you know, respect people, understand their needs, the issue around, okay, we, need, they ha we have to be very transparent, what data is col being collected from the farm, how it's being used, who is accountable when something goes wrong. Uh, transparency goes a long way. Uh, and, and, you know, what are the, uh, legal and operational processes that makes this effort more ethical and responsible. So these are all the things that we need to look at. What well, data sharing technologies, obviously some, it could be centralized and decentralized given the need. Uh, so that's not the main challenge. Uh, there are some uh, old technologies such as EDI that can be used that we have been using for quite a long time. Obviously for data sharing, again, I put emphasis on data has to be linkable. Because I have to know, uh, for example, for health data, if you think about that age, gender, the type of cancer, for example, all of those are uh, established and standardized concept around the world. Obviously we cannot go to that level of perfection because agriculture by nature is different, but it has to be some consistency in definitions. And also if we can make it machine readable, um, make the data interlinked and uh, you know, to, that we are able to link the data. So that's a very important step. Or technologies, it doesn't have to be blockchain, but blockchain, but similar to blockchain that will enable it's distributed, but it as part of developing blockchain, I always say blockchain has been, uh, has been around for quite a long time. It's not the novelty, it's not the blockchain itself that is, it's because the way we build blockchain, we gather people and they have to talk about their needs and their concerns about they know data ownership and integration. That's what make blockchain, in my opinion, quite unique to be used in agriculture. Whatever that is, we need to enable those channels to share data because agriculture data is extremely valuable. Then now we have to think about data platforms and architectures. Um, it could be cloud, it could centralize, it could be, um, uh, the, the problem with centralized is, obviously there's an, a third party is always giving the service and it's involved. The issue of control maybe become a concern. Data has to be standardized and that's good because centralized data hubs, they usually take standardization quite seriously or it could be distributed such as blockchain. Again, blockchain is just one example, but it's distributed around that. But blockchain has the uh, positive aspect that is immutable, cannot be changed. But we need to think about different data architectures. And then we need to bring everything together that I just mentioned. And I, this, we cannot do it in the next five years, maybe in the next 10 years, very small scope project needs to be initiated. Needs of different stakeholders has to be uh, collected. It has to be shared with various people. We need to start opening, if possible, with some data API so that we enable that integration, data sharing, uh, and encourage basically data standardization. Whatever we do, we have to look at our approach slightly differently and start thinking about integration and sharing and standardization and you know, so all different aspects that I just spoke with, 
Um, so uh, the rise of the agricultural data platforms is moving forward. We need uh, to kind of integrate everything depending on the application to make it more usable. Uh, as much as my time permits, I'll go over two uh, case studies that I'm currently working on. One, as I told you, I, uh, I work on uh, building data platform. I'm helping university for Ontario Livestock and Crop Research Center. The progress we have made is we didn't have access to data, although they are smart farms. So some of my colleagues were driving to the farm, which is not 20 minutes from Guelph, to collect that data. Now we have built a data platform. I put, uh, you know, poultry here. We don't have poultry smart farm yet. It's it's uh, uh, now we are uh, they are building one center for swine. We have beef and dairy. Those are a very kind of high tech uh, uh, smart farms and very high quality that has been built. Uh, so for beef and da uh, dairy and crop, uh, we are building a crop is not as high. I mean, my colleagues individually or as a group, they have their own research, but we, we are collecting data. That's, that's, you know, we have a platform that gets the data from farm every night, sends it to, you know, of Guelph now we have uh, fiber optic in that area. We can think about real-time data analysis and co collection and anal analysis. We are building a dashboard to give a view, easier view to our to my colleagues to see the data. If you want, they want to have real-time view of what's happening and maybe collect more data and annotate data. So we are doing all of that, but as a research aspect uh, for, for my work and also to help and collaborate with the international community, we are building a centralized metadata repository. So we are defining finding definition, which is a very, as you can imagine, our <laughs> time consuming work because we don't have access. We have to reach out to many people, technology provider. Why did you collect this, uh, reach, uh, this data? Reach out to my colleagues to see if they understand the data or look at best practices and standards. So we are synchronizing our platform, not autom automated completely, but with some of the existing standards, maybe we enter definitions, format, you know, uh, relationship between different concepts manually. We are thinking of using artificial intelligence because I've done a similar work on food safety to extract concepts and also even build a relationship because it takes a lot of human annotation and effort to get involved. But I'm a computer scientist and my background is artificial intelligence. So, uh, you know, that's what I want to do. And my students are more interested in that type of research. But basically we are building that and uh, we will build a user interface. Admin obviously has control over it. They can generate their own uh, information, but uh, we have uh, researchers who can get access to it and even generate content, link data tables, their own publications if they want. And if my colleagues allow us, we may make part of it, very kind of toppest layer open to the public so that everybody knows what University of Guelph is doing and what kind of data we have. But I still need permission, but that's a, that's a vision. So with all our effort, what thing we are doing, we are crowdsourcing because metadata, I'm a computer scientist, my <laughs> students, many of them are kind of similar background, but we are crowdsourcing the, and help the effort use of um, expertise of my colleagues to look at metadata and help us validate it. With that metadata, then we want to kind of integrate it, um, show the benefit of metadata, which is integrated with the data platform to show how queries would become contextual and smart, you know, and also show the value of having metadata and taxonomies. We are looking at using existing taxonomies and ontologies how easily it become integration with other sources outside, you know, public open data from other organizations. So this is something that, that we are currently working on that will open up a collaboration with in national and international communities as well. Another case study I wanted to talk to you about, that's purely my research, my, my first research in digital ag uh, is around avian influenza outbreak. Uh, outbreak risk management. So I worked at BlackBerry on building decision support system for software quality <laughs> improvement. But then I used the same skills to, to see if I can use it in agriculture for avian influenza outbreak. Uh, we have published a lot in this area and it has gone, especially with pandemic, got a lot of attention. So we looked at different sources of data, social media as an open data concept, whether also was open data, 
We also wanted to get farm level data, which we couldn't get access to it. Unfortunately, either the data didn't exist, farmers were too busy to collaborate with us. I'm not sure if privacy of data was a concern, uh, but anyway, farm data we had to drop. And also global data, we had uh, FAO data, we had weather data, trade data, and also wild bird um, migration path data. <clears throat> so we get all of those data and look at many papers to understand how they have used it to model avian influenza and model risk, and then build our own database, uh, which is the back end is a database, the front end is a user. I don't know if you are familiar with decision support system. So this decision support system has an interface that your user uh, kind of interact with, the back end, lots of data gets, uh, I mean, there's a database that collects data from different sources. It has a data management a component. It has a knowledge base, which we have created. Knowledge base is around, again, definition. We know exactly what data we are collecting. And then models have also been built. So user can just select few things on the user interface, and it just gives them the information they want. So our focus has only been on certain areas, some information, WHO, OIE data that has been integrated to the system, Twitter data in that region, weather, and other data, wild bird path, you know, kind of uh, migration data. If you have that information, then we say, okay, the risk, there is an avian influence outbreak, we know because of OIE, and what's the risk that it will spread and those sorts of things. <clears throat> A beta version has been built or alpha. Um, and then uh, the next, Step for us, this is Twitter data. Twitter, even for avian influenza, for COVID, we, sh we have shown there is a very direct link between, uh, you know, uh, Twitter activity and uh, uh, an outbreak. Even for avian influenza, we have seen that um, kind of behavior as well. So now we want to uh, bring subject matter expert epidemiologists to test our, I mean, we had epidemi epidemiologists on our team to develop it, but we want to open it to, others to test it for us. Um, so this is a kind of an example of how standardization, clean data collection can be used. Obviously, to build a surveillance system, we are a lot of effort needs to be put into this in terms of the data quality and even the models and what is useful to predict avian influenza. These are still unknown because we don't have access to a lot of data, but it's, a, it's an interesting proof of concept. Um, so I want to conclude with this. So regardless of technology, again, to me, technology is the easiest. It just tell us what you need. Engineers, computer scientists, we build it. Whether it's a blockchain or, or decentralized platform that we can use federated learning, for example, on each node and then keep privacy and also analyze data. Um, whether it's virtual reality for chickens, I don't get the concept, but you know, making chickens feel that they are, you know, happy free range chickens and they can see the world differently, or it is augmented reality or if, even digital twin to test and analyze the ideas, or if it is for sustainability purposes that I started my uh, presentation on. Whatever that is, these principles that I talked about are absolutely critical that needs to be taken into consideration. And with these principles, maybe in a kind of a starting very small projects and gradually in an iterative manner, <clears throat> improving the project, making the project bigger, but considering all these requirements is the only way to go. At least it's a <laughs> first step to have platforms that are usable to a larger community, to have data that is shareable and makes sense, um, and uh, also train people, uh, awareness. As I give you an example around data ownership, data ownership in this day of age doesn't make sense. It has to be focused on, it has to be on the use. Focus has to be on how much control. And this only comes with, our, uh, with awareness and training. And, and also something that I've seen in uh, farming, smart farming is missing considering the human aspect, involve the end user, understand their needs, farmers, processors, and design technologies in a way that will help them more, make more comfortable to use it, they trust it. And uh, yeah, so, so I think these are core concepts that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Well, thank you very much, Rosita. Um, 
the uh, questions will be up to me this morning. We uh, we don't have the uh, interactive uh, process in place, and so I've been jotting down a few things. But it's 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 been very uh, uh, enlightening for me to see uh, the the various aspects that you've been uh, focusing on. It seems as though the sky is really the limit on mm -hmm. on a lot of the uh, um, data that we collect, as well as what we can use it for. Um, I'm wondering whether, you know, it seems to me in agriculture anyways, that one of the things that from a poultry science perspective is that we often see ourselves as a bit behind some of the other agricultural industries. Um, are some of these concepts that you've touched on um, being addressed more um, up front in some of these other industries that seem to be moving forward quicker with smart technology than, than the, is there some hesitancy that you see in poultry industry that doesn't exist to the same extent in other commodities? Um, I, okay, great question. I, I can't, uh, you know, I can't comment because all these challenges that I talked about, it's for all smart farming, you know, kind of uh, sectors. Uh, some of them are taking it more seriously just because, for example, dairy, they are highly regulated, they, techno they use technology a lot, it's embedded into their practices. So some level of interoperability and those concepts has been built into dairy, you know, but not to a great extent. So if d -Level provides some tools uh, to, to, for example, d dairy, they standardize it their own way, they, they're... I don't know if they're transparent or not. I don't want to comment on that. But those challenges exist across sectors for um, the farming sectors. Um, uh, so some, but some of them are more proactive. For example, crop, you know, the use of technology has been there for quite a long time. Their data is less sensitive because of, you know, the, uh, livestock is a little bit more sensitive because of disease outbreak, because of animal welfare, you know, some of, some of those issues and regulation. Crop is less uh, regulated. They have less concerns around, you know, their data is less sensitive. So they are more proactive in terms of adoption of technology if they have the budget, if they have the money, and if they see benefit in it. <laughs> but uh, why poultry? Poultry, I guess it goes back to their practices. Maybe chickens are slightly, or, or poultry is slightly cheaper. Uh, disease and management, they, they kind of uh, produce... Production is in uh, poultry is quite efficient, despite the fact that they are not using as much as technology as much technology mm. in comparison to some other, uh, you know, livestock. Uh, so I was looking at in even developing countries, poultry is the one that they are being quite they are quite successful in terms of producing. I think it's just different practices. I guess you guys are the subject matter expert. Have I seen hesitant? Um, we were unable to collect any data, to be honest with you, for the farm for the avian influenza project. I, I don't think the issue was trust because uh, based on, a, and I believe that's the case, an Australian study, uh, farmers trust researchers more than the others. <laughs> uh, uh, but so I, I would have thought they would share the data. Either they didn't have the data or did they, they, have, they didn't have the time to commit, commit and work with us to collect data. Um, so we have to find other ways, smart ways to collect. For example, we were looking at um, kind of uh, how busy farms are during an outbreak in terms of people going on, in and out because they could be the reason for a spread. Uh, that data didn't exist and nobody was willing to work with us to collect it. So, um, so I don't know, it's, it's just, uh, but the challenges I presented is also existing uh, in all sectors, agriculture mm -hmm. sectors, so. Okay. Well, this is a, a world poultry science lecture, and so I think it's appropriate that I ask a, a question about global uh, uh, production. And you've mentioned international partners and, and various things as well. Um, do you see that um, developing nations potentially would be um, easier to work with in some aspects than some of the some of the uh, um, more established nations as, as far as uh, adopting this technology and, and overcoming some of these, these issues? 
Um, from what I've heard, they are. They are, uh, they, that's a very good point. Uh, for example, India, <clears throat> they are using technology and, and that's a government mandate. Uh, so uh, there will be more and more, they are very proactive in terms of use of technology. Um, I know many of the Middle Eastern countries are looking at into, for example, especially for greenhouse and other ones, the use of technology has gained a lot of attention. And uh, it's it's a logo that is how we do things, for example, in Dubai and some other uh, countries in the Middle East. Uh, when, uh, is, so one of the, so one challenge that I have noticed with farm data and the issue around privacy ownership or confidentiality, on the one hand, as I mentioned, uh, so we leave everything to the contract. You know, whatever the contract says, the farmer uh, will, will follow that contract. Um, but, but in a way, uh, so data goes to the t technology provider only, but when you want to convince them that to share it with you, that's a big challenge. And I don't know if it is, they don't have time to think about it. They don't see the benefit. So uh, if we are not sharing data and if we are not forced to share data or generate data in, the, in a way that's shareable, we don't see the benefit, you know? So only technology providers will see the benefit if farmers adopt those technologies. Uh, so I think we need, need to look at the policy and educate uh, to just convince them that you know that there are benefits in sharing data, AI technologies get better if they see more data. You know, I guess all those sorts of information is missing. In Canada, it's very hard to get, uh, and in USDA, for example, they have best practices for data sharing and they can get access to farm data. We don't have that policy either. So, uh, so, so it's a little bit hard to get access to farm data in Canada, um, but I think we have to look at it seriously. First of all, respect farmers' needs and concerns, but find innovative way to share data. It could be aggregated data. It's, uh, the technology can do it. Once we know the requirements are, we can build that platform to share and integrate data. Mm. I found it interesting. You know, it's it's. In the news right now, quite a bit is the the some of the challenges that we're having to deal with because the climate is changing right before our eyes, really, and um, the the data generated from from climate itself mm -hmm. um, has so many applications. But I'm wondering whether, and this is really off the topic of what you've presented, I think, but uh, looking for an opinion as to whether technology can keep step with the changes that, is, that are happening as it is. I know we see news stories quite often about predicting various um, aspects of climate that could potentially impact agriculture in, in short and long term. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, technology uh, is—it depends on one te what type of technology. For example, um, data processing is uh, and storage is improving. You know, as you know, there are, we are constantly. We can our servers have the capacity to collect more data. AI algorithm. So once you have better, when I think about when I was doing my PhD at Waterloo, University you know, so of Waterloo, and how much data would t would have taken weeks to process right now it's just a matter of a few seconds so we have come a long way in terms of some technologies in terms of building some, something that's useful that's a different story so the core part of the technology is i think it has advanced a lot building something that's useful for the agriculture community for the poultry uh, you know community that's a different story it's first of all uh, knowing what is or climate change what needs to be predicted because that's always we think what we know but when we start analyzing then we know we don't know so it's an iterative <clears throat> process so first of all it's a collaborative effort so there has to be lots of uh, diverse expertise collaborating and it is an iterative process so uh, you uh, identify goal collect data if it doesn't exist analyze it if it is only ai and then you go back maybe for a year to or longer, uh, collect more data to be able to build a system that's useful. So none of the things that I presented, is something that can be done, for example, in a year or two, maybe maybe we are looking in 10 years to have something that's useful. 
but other technologies can be built you know sensors uh, you know can be drones that that are more accurate sensors that are um more that can generate the data that we don't have access to so all of those needs to be uh, advanced but i would say for data management data governance and processing we are in a good shape there are lots of algorithms ai algorithms algorithms that we haven't even used in agriculture that can be used to uh, you know extract insight and information from data for some technologies again we need to advance for example virtual reality uh, the use in even poultry and augmented reality for example they they talk about training um, farm managers or or any anybody uh, agriculture expert using virtual uh, augmented reality is quite impressive you don't need to be at the farm you can just you know so so lots of things that needs still need to get done blockchain for example it's a hype it's interesting but it's very it requires a lot of resource to build that so that needs to get uh, it needs to be advanced so anyway so uh, but i think i have a feeling that te technology may move slightly faster um, um yeah, but but I may be wrong. Well, um, I think that's that's all we have for for questions okay. this morning. But I want to thank my uh, American partners with WPSA American Branch and uh, and the support that I have within our Canadian branch for uh, uh, supporting this talk this morning and and uh, um, the. Uh, Thank you very much for taking the time to to uh, take and uh, give this very interesting presentation. I think this is really a, the tip of the iceberg. You're you're on the the, the front edge of something really uh, valuable to our our human population for sure in in many ways, and uh, and I think you just gave us a small window into what some of the challenge was will be. Uh, we do have a symposium Wednesday morning, and I would encourage everyone to, uh, if this has whet your appetite for for smart technology, that we have a, a symposium Wednesday morning starting at 8, that's 8 Central, that uh, will be continuing to cover this particular topic. So again, once I'd like to thank you and, uh, and uh, take care. Thank you very much for having me, Bruce. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a